going quickly. Um, it, that, that is, is growing. And um, it's also a particular issue in urban areas. So we, we decided to look at the, you know, what, what we needed to do in order to address that. Um, sorry. Um, so we can see there's a significant rise in childhood health issues, as I said, a quarter of the children are overweight or obese. Um, we also have, um, looking at the physical environments in which children are growing up in, it has an impact on their health and their enjoyment of childhood. There is also a huge increase in children with mental health difficulties. Um, there's a disconnect from nature in urban areas. And we know that creating better play environments uh, leads to better physical and mental health for children. So what type of play is important? So the, the plastic or the big colorful play equipment on the left, that type of play is where society has been going to over the past 30 years. And it's been driven by the notion that safety is what's all important in play. Um, rather than the image on the right is how children would have played for generations. And it was about how we understood the world around us, things like that. That was a normal childhood. And we became very focused on a safety led childhood. Um, but what children actually need, when we talk to play specialists, the youngest children, imaginative play is what's really important. So if I'm talking to a class full of children and I show them the rocks there on the left and I say, what, what is this? Every hand in the class goes up and they say it's winner of the Olympics, it's troll under the bridge, it's princess castle, it's a million different things. So it's really a prop for the imagination and having something like that, if I put that in 20 different uh, residential areas, it'll have 20 different names. There'll be different games will happen around it. There'll be people sit there in the evenings, all like that. Again, the image on the right with the girls and the rock. I'm not sure exactly what they're playing there, but they're engaged with it. It's a prop for the imagination. Then constructive play. Again, this type of thing, water, sand, muck, grass. Um, it's a really important type of play for children. It engages children of all ages. Children of different ages will play together on it. Boys and girls will play together on something like this. And it's sort of like the, the outdoor version of uh, what a lot of children do at home. They turn the chairs upside down and throw a blanket across it and make a den. And it teaches children that you know, when you do something, it can have an, an outcome. So it forms really good for, for forming brain connections, complex thinking. Um, so there, there's so, so many things that, that this type of play, children are naturally drawn to it. Now, when they don't have it, it's the exact same thing to drives them to destructive play behaviors, to, to breaking something or so th to have these type of play experiences available to them is very important. And then uh, risky play. So uh, we have almost become obsessed with trying to take uh, the risk out of play, but it's actually very important. Um, sorry. It's actually very important for children um, and, and risk and danger are, are different things. But as you can see what's happening here with this log, the first chap here on his knees, he was thinking, I'm gonna be brave, brave enough to, to crawl across here. And then his friend on the other side is standing up. Maybe he'll walk across it and the group of lads are watching and there's excitement and there's learning. And all of this is, is happening here, which is really good for children. Now, um, across Western Europe and in America, we all have gone this, this safety culture way. And we don't really let children take risks until they're teenagers. And that hasn't turned out terribly well for us because when they're teenagers, there's other factors at play. There's maybe drink or there's driving and stuff like that. So to have children be able to test their boundaries from a young age is really important for, for child development. Um, we do this in South Dublin in different ways. You, you won't always have a 
natural streams and places like that, but you can build play equipment in such a way to replicate that. So this climbing frame here in Griffin Park is actually quite difficult to climb. There's parts of it that are easy to climb lower down. So we try and replicate natural experiences in the play equipment we use. Contact with nature is another thing that's really important for children. And a place like this, this type of garden has meets all the various play needs that young children will, will have. Um, you know, there's exploration, there's climbing, there's balance, there's imaginative play, there's constructive play. And contact with nature as well for urban children. It's a real stress reducer. I suppose we noticed it all now during this pandemic where people are using parks for their, their mental health and physical health, but it's also really important for children. Uh, group play. So a lot of the communities, I would say in South Dublin in particular, um, a lot of these big residential areas, people are, are moving into these areas. Uh, they might, children might not know um, a huge amount of people in the areas they live in. So if you can set up player ex experiences that work better with a group so that this helps socialization in children. So something like this, a swing where you need some people pulling and some people jumping on and things like that. They always work better because you're engaging. Children need to meet each other through play. So any equipment that encourages group play is very important. So again, you know, something like a wobble belt, it is much better when there's two or three kids on it uh, rather than something you do on your own, like going over and back on a swing. Um, part of uh, the philosophy in South Dublin, um, a number of years ago, we signed up to the Barcelona Declaration, and it means that we should be taking the needs of children with disabilities into account in all of our decision making. So we don't see sort of that there's a group with special needs. We see that people in society, there's all sorts of needs there. There's some people with disabilities. There's, you know, there's, there's people of all different abilities. So we design for that. So in talking about inclusive play spaces. Um, so we emphasize um, settings for play in South Dublin. We look for the more natural type spaces to focus on the needs of children's social play, imaginative play. Uh, as I said, inclusiveness is very important. And also we try and avoid plastics as much as possible and buy materials that are local materials um, that, are, to, that are natural. So um, the factors uh, affecting accessibility, well, the big things are um, where you locate a playground is very important. So if you can locate it, if it's a public playground close to a parking space, um, not have any steps in, things like that. There's no um, barriers to inclusion. Um, the other thing to consider is not just, I think people think, oh, accessibility, it's, it's children in wheelchairs. Um, it's a very small amount of accessibility is about children in wheelchairs. It could be parents with buggies. It could be granny bringing you to the playground. It could be people on crutches. Um, there, there's lots of, of reasons for accessibility that are other than, you know, the small number of children who, who are wheelchair users. Um, um, so, I'll, I'll just go through a small bit of the, the equipment we use. Um, every, everybody usually thinks of the wheelchair swing, the wheelchair exclusive swing. We don't have any of those in South Dublin. Um, we opt for universal accessibility, so equipment that everybody can use in the same way. So just a few of the, the popular pieces we have. The, um, these trampolines are very popular. You can get different styles on our bigger playgrounds. We try and have them so that the motorized chairs can use them as well. Um, where we have roundabouts, again, this is a group play equipment, but a roundabout that, that's accessible that a couple of chairs can go into, always work well. There's all types of seats you can get for swings. Um, where we have slides, we generally go with a double slide rather than a single slide so that a parent can go down the slide with their the child on their lap. Um, uh, so, you know, allows the carer and child to use the slide together. 
Um, communications boards is something new. Our first communications board is going into Corker Park very soon. We've been contacted by quite a few people who during lockdown and their children children with autism generally not having their usual support and be knocked out of their usual routine the people are having huge issues with with childhood with their children's behavior um, when children with autism get overly stressed it can be very hard to communicate for them um, you will have a lot of non-verbal children so we're starting to put in these communications boards into playgrounds so for instance I, you know if a child has become overly stressed and you can't communicate just by talking you could go to one of these and say mom is going to the slide with your little brother for five minutes then we will all sit on the grass and you know you allow them to communicate you tell them what's happening and it can be the difference between having to leave the playground and and being able to stay there and obviously play and time outside is very important um, for children on, uh, with ASD so um yeah, it'll be interesting to see how these work out. Uh, moving beyond equipment, because most play for us in South Dublin is not really about the equipment. It's about the, the opportunities. So this is just a, a picture taken last year in Griffin Playground. And it shows in any of our successful playgrounds, most of the children are not really using equipment at all. They're sort of hanging about and they're walking around and they're, you'll also see when we do these type of grassy playgrounds and lots of sand, the people spend, you know, it's a two to three hour visit here versus where any of our wet pour playgrounds where you're talking 20 minutes, 30 minutes maximum. So we try and make these comfortable grassy uh, type playgrounds more and more. So um, when we're talking about disability by far the greatest in terms of numbers of children it'll be it'll be children with autism um, rather than um, sort of physical disabilities so how do you address the needs of these children through playground design so again I, i'm definitely not an expert on autism but um, it affects about one in 150 um, children and there's issues around communication, social interaction, initiating play, making friends. Um, there's repetitive behaviors. Um, there's a need for uh, different sense, uh, sensory experiences. And children can also become very overly stressed. And from, we've talked to hundreds and hundreds of parents and parents can become very stressed in certain situations around play. So, um we sort of set out say how can the design of play spaces have an impact on the play experiences of children with autism so from our from our, our reading up on it we have found out that the contact with nature provides huge benefits to children with autism um just experience in nature is really good so to have that in play the rules of a playground may exclude a lot of children so for instance uh, we had one parent tell us that if their child would go and climb to the top of the slide and want to stand there, it's the highest point in the playground and they'll just want to stand there. And suddenly you'll have another child coming up the ladder behind them and they're saying this boy won't move out of the way and the parent is going, oh, there's going to be an issue here. And there's, you know, there are not, um, it's not an obvious disability and suddenly the stress builds up the child just wants to stand there in this position and the other child wants to get past and there's another parent saying oh that child is bold he won't let everybody take their turn and so these type of rules um can affect the experiences of children with autism so the less rules and the more free play the better um some children want to be out in bright sunshine others need shade so it's important to have both some children really need to be able to go and hide themselves away in order to be able to self-regulate so if it's all open that won't suit everybody and sensory rich environments are very important for some children and also to have quiet spots in a playground is also important so some of the examples in south dublin um that's stepping stones on the playground into time and park and um, this is lime kiln play space we put these two tables into a woodland just with mulch around them and we weren't really sure what would happen we were very worried that this might be an awful play space 
when when it went in but it had the contact with nature part it had um it was a quiet place for a lot of children now these children here didn't know each other uh we turned up to take photographs with permission to take the photographs but they all started playing together boys and girls of different ages and what they were doing here was cooking a ham and on the other table there was a girl and she had a restaurant going so this was imaginative play it was these children coming together different ages and the, the power of imaginative play to get children involved this type of thing doesn't happen on a springer or on the swings or on on things like that so um a parent would walk in there look at the two tables and go oh rubbish come on we're going find something to do something but it, it, these type of places are really important for childhood experiences um with hermitage play space one of the things that, that we try and do is pull back the fences from playgrounds if there's a woodland near it if there's a meadow near it include that in the play area and you're sort of saying, saying to children by doing that it is okay to play in the woods it is okay to play in the the meadows these are these are um, play experiences that are just as important as swings and slides um, they have very calming effect on children they help improve concentration you will have improved behavior generally if there's places like this that children can get to um, this is in uh, Corka Park playground it's one that uh, South Dublin have just revamped there recently but there was trees around it and we decided well let's rather than that be a place where nobody went let's put paths through it and offer this type of experience to children um here's time and park playground one of the things we do is we try to not clean up if we're offering a natural experience not cut the nettles not take away the briars not clean it up allow it nature to be wild and messy and and untamed so to tell that I'd stop cutting the grass don't uh, do the maintenance it's not needed children um children don't need it so you see here on the way into time and park playground you can go over stepping stones or you can get the risky feeling of, of crossing over the nets um sensory rich experiences this playground was based on the story of the fina the brown bull of cooley and we have the brown bull we have put in a nice shady spot and you're rarely in the playground that there's not an adult or a child sitting up on this bowl. On a day like today where it's warm, you'll feel the heat from it. Um, and you can see the carving. Children love that running their fingers across it. You will find adults love it. Um, and children, you know, you might find a child sit up there for half an hour. Like rarely anyone would be on a swing for half an hour. So, you know, it's a, these type of experiences, if you can include them, they're very worthwhile. Uh, mud is a great sensory uh, play material. So this is a mud pit in time and playground. So you can just look at these as sculptures and as sort of, you know, funny oddities, or you can get in the mud and play with the mud. Um, this was actually designed by the children in St. Joseph's Special Needs School in Tala um, as something they'd like to see in a playground. Lots of them like stomping around in the mud. Um, so you can see it during the winter, it can be heavy and muddy and parents have a love-hate relationship with these type of uh, play experiences, as you can imagine. Um, shady places, so uh, Willow is really good for this. Um, I would say if you're putting in Willow, keep it as low as possible. Uh, if it's something that you can hang on, it gets broken very easily. So if it's something that you have to duck your head to go through, um, all the better. Uh, this is a playground in Lucan. It's not the most popular playground, but again, we've been told by parents of children with autism that their children love it. They'll drag their feet through the grit. They'll pull the seed heads off the grass. They'll run around, jump over the bridges. Um, it's a great place for listening to bird song and seeing nature around you. Um, and I'll just I'll speed up a little bit. So some of the, the hidden design features. So as I said previously, if the slide is the highest point in a playground, there might be an issue. So we often put in big logs or things so that the highest point is somewhere else. No, nobody's going to say to this little girl here, excuse me, you've been standing up there for five minutes. It's, it's my turn. Um, this is a free play. There's no rules around it. Um, social interaction. 
uh, the little girl behind the shop there, I think she was Polish. She didn't speak English. These other, this little guy was playing there. They were exchanging pieces of grass for pieces of sticks. They were, um, this social interaction without any language was happening there. So that was, a, um, again, for urban children to have more and more opportunities for this social interaction is important. Um, what we do as well, we often mound around sand pits. So we said before about having hidden places. So children that uh, might find it difficult to make friends in a traditional playground, if they had to stand with their back to the fence in a defensive way, it's not very comfortable. But what, what happens is people sit on the mounds and they watch the play happening and they think, oh, that boy over there looks friendly. Maybe I'll go and play with him or I'm afraid of that child there. So we have these mounds where you can sit around and observe play and decide if you want to get involved or not. Um, again, moving away from equipment, sometimes we have different things like do stonework or carvings or that where a piece of equipment, it, this is done by the Liffey and Lucan. We didn't think equipment would be suitable down there. It, the park is about experiences of nature, but we children like things that are oversized compared to them like sunflowers or things that are tiny compared to them like daisies. So putting in these uh, uh, mushrooms and acorns and stuff was the, the response to that that brief. Um, here again, Avonbeg and Tala. And again, lots of these places, people said, if you build a playground there, it won't last five minutes. It'll be burnt down. It'll be destroyed. It'll be everything. None of these playgrounds are locked at night. They're all open 24-7 to the public. But by using robust materials like this, sand, rocks, nothing ever happens there. These playgrounds are, are as good today as, as when they went in. Uh, this is Willsbrook and Lucan. Again, it shows the sort of mix between equipment, and the, the natural play experience. You can see the risky play behaviors there. Um, and one of the big things we learned about looking at um, the accessibility and play is that if you, um, if you concentrate on accessibility, it actually makes it better for everyone rather than special needs putting in stuff that just children in wheelchairs can use. So here we have a sand pit in uh, Willsbrook Park. Most days of the year, okay, it's a sunny day there, they're sitting there playing in the sand. Most days when people come, they run in and play at the sand tables because the sand is maybe wet or stuff like that. Um, we find that where, um, oh, sorry, I'll just go, go through the last few here. This is Willsbrook Park, this is uh, our Corka Park. This is a um, um, uh, water feature we put in recently. So it starts off as a water pump. The water goes along, it comes up an Archimedes wheel and it has various ways of, of coming out through so that you get all of this constructive play, you get imaginative play. Um, you'll see children of different ages playing together. All of this is wheelchair accessible. It's uh, sensory play. It's very good tactile play um i think yeah um so yeah improving access for a few makes it better for everyone making playgrounds more comfortable for children with autism makes them more comfortable for everyone we've increased the time people spend in playgrounds from half an hour to a couple of hours because they're so comfortable for parents to sit around as well we've found that everybody enjoys the sensory play experiences not just um, children with autism. Um, so there's there's so many um, um, reasons to consider sort of natural play and inclusive play in the design of playgrounds. So what I might do is just leave it there, and if there's any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. I found that quite inspiring. Um, I was going to ask you how you got. Um, a water source into a park but that water pump illustrated that and um, I know I have cycled through the Lucan domain and I love those um, timber sculptures it's quite quite inspiring um, so does anyone have any questions Ernie there's one there in on the, the chat function okay Christy Boylan. Oh yes, um, 
is that's the one. Yeah, um, Lawrence Christie has asked, um, what is the situation? Oh, hold on, it's just jumped off there. What is the situation regarding fencing and insurance? Um, there is no requirement for us to have fencing on any of the playgrounds. So Irish public bodies are our insurer and we, uh, we obviously need a ROSPER or, or PII search before we open any of the playgrounds. So we don't have to have fencing anywhere. I generally um, have fencing where we have sand pits because people bring dogs into playgrounds yeah. and I don't want there to be dog wee or people used to talk about cats a lot. I've never ever seen a cat come into a public playground or uh, we've never found cat poo and we check them, check them take at the start, especially because we were worried about this. But um, the fencing we have, uh, obviously, if you're near a road or that, you, you'll make a call on it. But if it's inside in a park or in lots of residential areas, we don't have fencing. Yeah, thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, we have uh, the next question from um, Emma Allroyd, and, and Emma's talking about um, grass slopes in playgrounds um, that are steeper than one in three, one in four are difficult to mow with a sit-on mower. Um, what's your advice to demonstrate um, your approach, or do you have a, a, a guideline for um, a, a gradient over a specific size? Um we we worried about this for a long time and then we started building them and say a big grassy playground like say griffin park um we rarely have to cut the grass if anything the grass gets worn away completely in the summer it has come back by the following summer um they, you get so much trampling and the mounds become the playthings themselves and people sitting on them. We haven't found, um, we haven't really had any issues with maintenance at all. It was something that we worried about and you think in theory you would have to mow them. It's not something that has become an issue in any of our playgrounds. And we did this everywhere now because mm. um, it, the, the type of things that can happen when you use sand or wood chip a lot is how do you enclose it so that it's not brought out everywhere? And we enclose everything in mounds so that we're not, there's not wood chip on all the paths and there's not sand on all the paths. So we basically dig a pit and put the, the materials into that and then mound up around it. Um, we have not found that we are needing to cut the grass on those slopes. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, we have a, a question from uh, from Mark Nugent. Um, uh, I might hopefully get this wrong. Uh, don't get this wrong, Mark. But uh, Mark has said, is there any trouble getting ROSPA cert for no rules play? No, no. Um, Can you explain what ROSPA cert is? So ROSPA, um, that's the Royal Society of Prevention of Accidents. They you, um, certify the safety of, well, it's actually or, or PII, but ROSPA are, are a, an organization that provides certification as well. Um, so they there's two standards, uh, EN 1176 and EN 1177. They are around the, uh, um, the play equipment and play surfacing. So outside of that, um, if there's a big boulder, it's just a big boulder. It's not a piece of play equipment. If I put two boulders very close together and there's a chance someone could catch their leg in it, um, that will come up on the safety inspection and I'll have to move them apart so that there's not. But there is no issue. And we find with natural play and it's the international experience that when something looks more dangerous, say like climbing up on a big boulder what children will do or, or we have a lot of big um, tree trunks so a five-year-old will climb up into the fork between the the two branches and they shout mom mom look at me look at me look how brave i am up here and when they're six they might jump from there and the eight-year-old might climb to the top of one of the things and then the teenager will flip off backwards into the sand they don't no small child ever climbs up to the top and falls off the top because it sort of feels a bit dangerous where the accidents where we typically have is where a monkey bars and dad lifts a child that's too small up and they're hanging on there and then then they fall um, 
with with natural things that look more dangerous, children are more cautious. Very good, thanks. Um, and then we have a, um, a question from Liam Campbell. Um, and Liam has asked, do you find that uh, different age profiles use the play spaces at different times of the day? Um, it is around, uh, I suppose it's around school finishing up time. So um, at the moment, if you go to, into say Corker Park, one of our bigger parks, there will be toddlers in there, mostly around the sandpit from early morning. Um, the younger children get out of school. So playgrounds and school times are, the, there's a big connection there. So outside school times, playgrounds are different. And we have the older children then obviously are finished school, the secondary schools. Um, a lot of teenagers still use playgrounds as places to go. Um, doesn't seem to be such an issue in the bigger ones. There can be conflicts with parents of small children in the smaller ones, you know, if they're hogging the swings or that type of thing. But yeah, it, it's it's mainly around school times that the, the user numbers. So it's great. Um, um, and a question there from Mark Campbell: um, How are you managing to provide spaces for teenagers and young adults? Um, we have just started uh, building um, we, uh, a building program. We call it our teen space program. So we have been consulting with teenagers right around the county for I don't know, the last year or two and looking at what are the needs of teenagers growing up in, in communities. So the big thing that they've been saying to us is we just want some place that we can hang out. They say that if they meet in their estate they're told clear off out of here if they go to the shops they're told to move on if they come down to our playgrounds they say that we're moving them on as well if they sit on a park bench they're told that's for grannies they're they're constantly being moved around and the only place they're not moved from is if they go down behind some dodgy container or some place that you don't really want them going in the first place and they don't particularly want to be there either so we're going to give them places uh, where they can meet up uh, they want free Wi-Fi and they want something to do. So the type of things we're doing is we've put in a ball wall recently in Lucan. We're putting in football tables. We're putting in calisthenics equipment and parkour equipment, music points, pretty cool, funky seating. Um, and we are, we've started, we're building in Collinstown Park at the moment. We'll be in Ballycra Park. So we're going to be building these right around the county for the next three years. So it's somewhere to meet up and something to do. Great, Lawrence. Um, and then a question from Celia. Um, are the communication boards available to others? Um, Celia is involved in a sensory garden in Skerries, and this would be useful for her. What I'll do is um, I will send around a, a contact. Maybe you can send it out to all participants after. Uh, we got a really great help um, in in designing the board and I'll send on the, the contact details of the, the people responsible for that. That's marvellous. Um, would anyone else like a, uh, to, to pose a question? Um, oh, here's another one in from Gillian. Um, and Gillian says, with the revived interest in biodiversity, have you found that any of the communities request additional pollinator planting when they, that they can care for within the parts, presumably themselves? Um, no, we haven't. Um, but I suppose that the way the way we operate in in if I'm designing something, um, even if I'm working with a community group and people say, yeah, we're going to be involved in this over the long term, really anything that, that I put in, I have to be confident that the council are going to be able to mm. to, to manage it. Um, what, what I have found is that more and more people are um, they like the more natural thing. So our tastes are, are shifting. Um, a lot of our, our program, we were going into residential areas and what people definitely did not want, like most of these playgrounds were objected to strongly by the communities they went into as a starting point. People had very negative opinions about what happened at night in playgrounds. And I suppose they had a picture in their head of this really colorful equipment in the, on the rubber surfacing with a metal fence around it and a metal bench and a bin and this hard urban 
sort of feeling. And when we started saying, well, look at play can be landscaping, play can be gardens, it can be boulders. People really like this look and this type of aesthetic. They like the timber. Um, we, we haven't used metal equipment in a in quite a long time. Now we, we're still open to using it, but um, the, the wilder aesthetic in terms of planting, meadows, that type of thing, and the more natural look, people are, are more likely to go for it. It's more appealing. That's our experience. Great, Lawrence. Um, no other questions, I don't think. Just um, endless messages that that's been a very inspiring uh, presentation and fabulous photographs. It's Yes, it's absolutely marvellous, Lawrence, and it gives people in private practice um, an idea of what you may find acceptable when they go in for their pre-planning. Yeah, I suppose um, the difficulty for landscape architects is your client is a developer rather than a, a community. So we've learned a lot from actually talking to the communities. And when we talk to a community about play, um, you know, a lot of the people, most of the people who turn up at our meetings turn up to object. So there are people in their 70s and 80s and stuff. So how do you talk to people about play? So we talk, say, how did you play as a child? Tell me about your childhood play experience. And nobody remembers back to some really safe place with rubber surfacing and stuff. They remember hidden areas and wilder areas and they have vivid things about what was important to them, memories of what was important to them as a child, you know, generations later, they, they can remember it. And we said, well, would you object if your grandchildren had the opportunity to do that where they live? And it's very hard for them to say, yes, I would. Whereas they come from a starting point, oh, children nowadays have everything. And we say, well, do they have what you had? All these lovely wild play experiences and, and they didn't. So. That was a lot of how we got around the, the consultation was talk about what are the important elements of play and should children living where you live have those things to do. So you have a great understanding of people, Lawrence, I must say, and you're very entertaining. <laughs> Thank um, you. Any last questions for Lawrence or will we let him get off for his lunch break? <laughs> no more questions. Um, no, that was great, Lawrence. That was very successful. You you did that with ease. Um, so <laughs> just to say, um, no, thank you very much, Lawrence. And um, it has been recorded. And um, I think Anne will circulate this. Um, and would you like to have the last word, um, Lawrence? Anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, I suppose. Um, um, it, yeah, if anyone has any questions about how to do it or the, the detailing of it or the tendering of this type of play or anything like that, we'd be very happy to, I'd be very happy to share any, any of that or any of the images or anything like that. So that's just. marvelous. Um, just um, for next month, I think we're currently um, looking to um, make a presentation on on suds, um, but we will confirm that um, in advance. Um, Anne, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, nothing at present, Bernie. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you next month.